And now, another timely and powerful message from Pastor Emmanuel Williams and Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee. This morning, I want to present the final installment on this topic before we move to move onwards to uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 25. I think that's where we're going to move. Amen. So what I want to do, I want to use one scripture verse in this final session. I want to unpack this scripture verse because in this verse, we have in detail what the process of transformation involves. Amen. In one verse in the Bible, God tells you how you and I can be transformed. Transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say image? Transformed to be somebody just like Christ. And when I say just like Christ, I'm not talking about in the natural, looking like him physically. But in the spirit, thinking like him, moving like him, behaving like him, representing a perfect representation of who he is. Amen. There is a process to do that. And you hear me, Abraham, I'm not going to be long. Let me tell you why I'm not going to be long. Because I need you to get that point. I need you to understand that. Because the truth is, if many of us started the pursuit of transformation, amen, we would have experienced more victories in our lives. Let me say that again. Not only would we have experienced more victories, certain things we would have stopped. Certain things the enemy bring, brought into our lives. Amen. Because you think like God, move like God, behave like God, be, become very sensitive to God. He'll tell you certain things. Just whisper little things to you. Not that. Do that. Amen. And so I think as a body of Christ, to our own peril, we have, I should say, inadvertently disregard this process. It wasn't done. Hmm. Because we just chose not to do it. But somewhere, somehow, when we became Christians, we just, get, we just got a little busy. Can somebody say busy? Busy and uh, because of that, we just sometimes fail to pursue the uh, route of transformation. But this morning, I want to spend some time discussing it with you. Amen? I want you to notice that this is the verse I want to spend some time discussing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Amen? It reads, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. This is what happened to us as we behold the glory of the Lord. We are changed. Can somebody say changed? changed. Into the same image from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. When we sang this song this morning, um, what's the first song we sang? A chosen generation. Amen. We're moving from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. Take a look at me. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Can you see him what? Can you see his what? Glory. You, can you see his glory? Yeah, yeah, that's what we're seeing. And we're affirming to the devil, mm -hmm, who is our major critic. You're not, you're not affirming to other people. You're affirming to the devil and to yourself. Your, our problem is not other people. Our problem is the devil and us. The thoughts that come to our minds. So you're affirming to yourself. Can you take a look at me now? Can you see his glory? Uh huh. Because he's not done with me. Amen. I am a work in progress. So I'm moving from glory to glory. But most times we say it, but we forget the process to move from glory to glory. This is telling us to move from glory to glory. There is a process. You don't just say it and go home and sit down. Are you getting what I'm saying, saints? Christianity takes work. Uh huh. It takes what? Work. Work. If you really want it to work, you've got to work it. Now that same word, this is in the King James Version changed. That same scripture in the New King James Version, that word is not changed, but it's what? Transformed. Same scripture. Thank you so much. I was looking for that. Same scripture. Amen. Different uh, translation. King James transfers this word as changed. The New King James transfers uh, 
translates it as transformed and the amplified translates the same word changed as what? Transfigured. Doesn't that word sound familiar? Transfigured. So we could say here, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are transfigured or are transformed <laughs> into the same image from what? The Bible says the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. Amen. The path of the righteous shines what? It doesn't happen automatically. You and I have to do something for it to shine brighter and brighter. Uh-huh. Glory be to God. So, changed, transformed, and transfigured, same Greek word. Amen. You remember what, what happened to Jesus when he was transfigured? Amen. On the mount? Uh, I think it's Matthew 17 too. The Bible says he transfigured and his face began to shine like the sun. He transfigured. What was in him came out. Transformation is to go through, a, is to change the in nature. Uh-huh. He had a change. He showed and was transfigured. Here is the same word here in Matthew chapter 17 verse 2. Transfigured, changed, transformed before them. And he's going to tell you what happened when he was transformed. His face did shine as the sun. Mm-hmm. And his raiment, his clothing, was white as the <laughs> Oh, glory be to Jesus. Since that's what, hopefully, that's where we are heading. We want our face to look like Jesus. Jesus' face. His face was full of light. Amen. Now, Jesus' face was full of light. It doesn't mean that your face and my face is going to be full of light. But certainly, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a smile on your face. Glory be to God. There's going to be a, a change in your demeanor. There's going to be a change in the way you speak. That's the light we're talking about. The light on Jesus' face is a metaphor. To, uh, amen. It means a change in demeanor. You become nice like Jesus. The Bible says Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. People will, it, people will just want to flock over to you. The Bible says Jesus was a friend of what? Publicans and sinners. He wasn't a friend of the, of the Pharisees. The high and mighty, so they think. Amen. But he was a friend of publicans and sinners. That's why I have a problem when people don't want to be around sinners. I'm not saying you go sit down with them and joke with them and drink their cognac, whatever they drink. I'm just saying you care about enough to tell them about the gospel of Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying, saints? A little love takes, goes a long way. A little goodwill goes a long way. But it's difficult to do that when you're not transformed. It's difficult to do that when you have been, when you have been, uh, I'm looking for a nice word. <laughs> You know, some of us, we just grew up in church like myself. It took me a little while to break out of that mentality. You see, I grew up in church all my life. And I thought, well, I had to be in church all the time. Glory be to God. Just like an old Pharisee. Until God, had to say, until God said to me, look at Jesus. Look how he lived. He was with the common people. That's who he, that's who he, that's who he, he was with all the time. And uh, he went and he, he went to the house of a, he went to the house of a, a tax, tax collector. Uh-huh. What's the tax collector's name? You remember he was short. Zacchaeus. I'm looking for help, but I get nothing out there, but that's okay. Zacchaeus was so short, he went on a tree because Jesus was passing by. The man had a heart for Jesus, but because he was, he was looked down upon by society, he was hated by the Jews. He's just trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. So what he did, he became a tax collector. And when he picked up the tax for the Romans, he added his own because he's got to leave. Somebody say, man, he's got to make a living. He's got a family. Are you with me, saints? But we would look, we despise people like that, but not God, not Jesus. Since I tell you, when you look at what's happening out there, if it doesn't break your heart, you need to ask yourself whether you feel like Jesus, whether you see like Jesus. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? It breaks your heart to see people who think they got it together, but they don't. Let me share with you something. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you see your frailties. The more you see your issues and the more humble you will get. Are you with me? So I know when people say they are close to Jesus, I look at you and I know you are not telling the truth. When you get close to God, you realize. When Peter got close to God, he said, what Isaiah, he said, what is me? I'm a man of undone lips. Read it. Isaiah chapter 6. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. He said, he's shrine. You need to see God high and lifted up. Transformation will do that. When you see God high and lifted up and he's showing, he got a vision of God. And he fell on his face and he said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. And instead of taking responsibility, he said, because I live amongst unclean people. No, Isaiah, that's just who you are. Amen. You choose to be unclean. You talk like them. Are you with me? Take respon Take what? Responsibility for where you are. It's a sign of maturity. Take responsibility for where you are. Amen. And so what we need to do, we need to, we need to be like Jesus. We need to aspire to be like Jesus. Not with our face shining. Amen. Because folk, if, if your face shining like Moses came down from the mountain, we'll look at it in a while. When his face come from, when he came down from the mountain, his face was shining. Nobody could come close to him. He had to put a veil on his face. I'm not talking about that. You need a change in demeanor. You need a change in mindset. Are you with me, saints? I, there's some people that, you know, you just, you just like being around them. They, they're just, they're something in them attracts you. Are you getting what I'm saying, saints? Because in their mind, because a, the, there's a different a story playing in their mind. Let me say that. There's a different story circulated in their mind. It's a story of God. Are you with me, saints? Not the some of us are so full of ourselves, full of our challenges, full of our problems, full of other people in mind. It shows on our faces. That's right. We need to be transformed. We need to be what? It's time. That's how we're going to evangelize the world. I was telling somebody last week, no longer can we depend on one superhero preacher to promote the cause of God. We all must be empowered. We are the priesthood of believers. And I have a sense, I have a passion for that. To see every believer representing Jesus Christ as should. The, I'm talking, you. <laughs> Every believer lay hands. Every believer empowered with God. Ah, yeah. oh God, I give thee praise. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh. Glory be to Jesus. Since we are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a holy people, are you with me? That's who we are. It's just that it's difficult to embrace that truth for some reason. Because we haven't gone through transformation. Since I beg of you this morning, I beg of you. I started the process of transformation too late in my life. And it's the reason why I started it too late is because and there is nothing. And hear me. Sometimes when I talk the truth, amen, it's not to criticize anybody. Because I believe we all live in a glass house. Amen. So you cannot be talking about anybody. But the reason why I did not transform as I should is because my spiritual teachers did not push me to devour God's word. They didn't push me to reading and studying. I thought reading and studying was for the superhero preacher. Uh huh. I, 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 am I the only one who thought so? No, that's because that's how it came across. Amen. But I, re, I but I'm, but I'm, but I'm beginning to realize this is for all of us because the devil come after all of us. Mm -hmm. So we need to be empowered with God's word. So that's why I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you and I need to take responsibility and immerse yourself in God's word. Somebody said to me, Pastor, I cannot read. I said, there is adult education. It's the 21st century. Get yourself somewhere at TCC in an adult education program and learn to read. Because the Bible came to us in a book. So you got to do what you got to do, amen, to be able to read God's love letter. Since sometimes you got to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Gone out of days like you gone out of days where you could leave your head down looking at Facebook and a cell phone all day. 
The same phone you have, you have a Bible software on your phone. You can look, are you with me? We need to spend more time in the light of God than in the light of our TV and cell phone. Let me say that again. We need to spend more time in the light of God's word than in the light of our TV and our cell phone. <laughs> and sometimes I'm at the house, I'm saying, I wish if I knew. In my early 30s, in my early 20s, pastor, I wish a pastor had gotten on my back and said to me, why don't you devour as you're devouring now for the past 15, 20 years? What if you'd started at the age of 25? Mm, God, I give you praise. Mm. Glory be to God. But I tell you, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So, uh, um, so this is the scripture verse I want to unpack today. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And I'm, I'll just give it to you quickly in case I don't get to it. Let me give you a Reader's Digest version. And then, <laughs> praise the Lord. And then, if time permits, we'll go through it meticulously. Is that all right? In here, we have a five-step program to be transformed into the image. This is what I want to see you. Into the image. Into the image we are looking. And notice by whom the transformation is done. The transformation is done by whom? The Spirit of the Lord. But that doesn't mean you and I have, it says the Holy Spirit here has his part, and you and I have our part. We're in this together with God. The Holy Spirit has his part. This is our part. We are still looking, but not looking at TV or our cell phone on Facebook. We're looking at a glass. A certain glass. And in that glass, we're going to see the glory of the Lord. But the very first step, brothers and sisters, amen, are you with me? The very first step is to, is to recognize and embrace that we all are called to the process of transformation. Can you say we all? No. We all. No. That's not only for pastors and preachers and evangelists and prophets and deacons, but for the ordinary Job Low Christian like us. Let me say that again. <laughs> I, know, I know some of you don't believe me. But it's right there. We all. It is for whom? All. It is for all of us, saints. Can you say me too? Me too. Yeah. It is for all of us. We are called unto the kingdom of God by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Then we have to be conformed, transformed to his image. The word conformed here. Amen. The word, uh, the word conformed. Uh, Romans 8, 29. You got it? Oh, we haven't gone to it. Let's go, to our, uh, uh, let's go to Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Sorry about that. Because what Romans 8 29 gives us, it gives us the process. It gives us the title. It names the process, but it doesn't give the description. The verse we saw gave the description. Let's do Romans 8 29. You got it? For whom he did. Is it 8 29? Yeah, yes. Let me say this right here, brothers and sisters. When we all got saved. Mm-hmm. God had one goal in mind. One goal. Not to go out and witness to everybody. For that matter, he told the disciples, wait for the power before you go out. Because you're going to run into some devils out there. You're going to run into some challenges out there. Wait for the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Before you go out. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. So you wait, but as soon as you got saved, you and I got saved, God's goal was to ensure that we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And the more you become like Jesus is, the more powerful you will be. You'll be able to witness even better. You'll be able to articulate your faith better. So the Bible says, for whom he did for new, God looked down the corridors of eternity and he said, hmm, everybody who accept Christ, I'm going to make them into little Jesuses. That's my goal. God didn't go down through the corridors of eternity and said, I'm going to pick you, not you. <laughs> I'm going to pick you, not you. Calvinists teach that. Mm -hmm. God does not do that. The Bible said God is no respect of persons. Romans 11, 2 says God is no respect of persons. He doesn't, are you with me? He doesn't practice partiality. God doesn't say this is my preacher, but not you. No, God doesn't do that. 
I know, I know you may have heard that elsewhere, somewhere, but that's not in the Bible. God doesn't practice partiality. You'll see Peter said a while ago when Peter was brought to the house of Cornelius, the Jews thought they were high and mighty. The Jews thought they had a monopoly on God. The Jews thought that some is somehow they above everybody and God, God empowered the Gentiles with the Holy Ghost. They started speaking. They started speaking with tongues just like the Jews. And Peter said, no, I know that God doesn't practice partiality. He treats everybody the same way. Peter, a preaching racist. It took Peter a while to get his stuff together. Peter went down, you remembered, Peter went down to Antioch and he was with the Gentiles and Peter was eating, he was eating pork roast, rump roast, bacon, while the disciples, while, while the oversight committee wasn't there, that's how hypocrite he was, he was eating pork and chitlins and uh, you name it, as soon as the Gentiles put it on the table, Peter devoured it. As soon as James and John came from Jerusalem, Peter distanced himself and Paul kept looking at him. And when he did it the second time, Paul said, you hypocrite! Are you getting what I'm saying? Sometimes, anyhow. But Peter finally made it. Because one day when Peter finally was transformed, the Bible says he just walked down the streets of Jerusalem and people began to touch him. His shadow fell on Kaba Sandobo. He was finally transformed. Sometimes it takes time. Finally got it. And every time I read about Peter, I say, thank God there is hope for me. There is hope for me. Oh, glory be, there is hope for me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God, there is hope for me. Since can you, can you imagine that day when the power of God flows through you unhindered? Just flows effortlessly. Because God wants to touch people through you. God is looking for somebody to flow through. So he can touch the world. Will it be you brothers and sisters? Will it be me? He's looking for somebody to go through the process of transformation. Now you with me? Go through what? The process of what? Formation. That we give you praise. Hallelujah. So the Bible says here, the goal of Christianity is what? To be conformed to the image of Jesus. Can you go back to our text? Romans 8, Romans 8, 29. This is what God said. So he, he also predestinated. You know, the Calvinists teach predestination. They say, well, God predestined some to go to heaven. And God predestined some to go to hell. No, no, no. Notice the, the, notice is that the word predestination is, doesn't appear on its own. Notice how specific God is. Predestinate to be conformed. The predestination is to be conformed, not just predestination on its own. Let me tell you, when you have an agenda, God's word, you cannot see God's word right. Let me, let me say that, when you have an agenda, if your sermon is not to glorify God, God cannot give you revelation knowledge. If your sermon is to unburden your guilt, You will miss things that's obvious in front of you. If your sermon is to attack somebody, you will not see God in the word. You will misrepresent God. Amen. That's why you got to leave people alone. What you do? Leave people alone. You keep trucking along and praise the Lord. Amen. You, may, you take your stance. You're not going to run over me. Mm -hmm. you, no, 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 no. Somebody else, you will. Not this one here. But we are, we, we are brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord and let's move on. Yeah, right. Praise the Lord. No, you know where I stand. I know where you stand. Yeah. Are you getting what I'm saying, saints? Yeah. But you keep moving and you praise the Lord. You treat them nice. You still hug and smile. Praise the Lord. And you keep trucking along. Yeah. Giving God the praise. Yeah. Give it, let, let me share with you. Some people will never change. Let, let me, can I tell you? So, <laughs> Just like Jesus said, the poor you love with you always, some people will never change. They will always remain unregenerate. Carnal, saved, going to heaven, but carnal. They will not submit to God's word. 
They will not do what God's word says. Let me tell you how powerful it is to do what God's word says to do. When you humble yourself, are you with me? And you do it, then you have the power to convey it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lack of submission to God's word. That is why many of us are just powerless. That's right. When, hear me, this is what the centurion said to Jesus. The centurion came to Jesus because his servant was sick. And he told Jesus, he said, you don't have to come to my house. All you have to do is speak the word. And guess why he said that? He said, because I am a man under. He didn't say because I'm all for people. No, no, no. He said, I'm a man under authority. And because I'm under authority, I have the power to convey authority. Are you getting what I'm saying? He said, I know how to submit myself. Because when you submit yourself, you position yourself for power. That's why rebellious people doesn't have a chance with God. That's right. Let me say it. Who? Rebellious people. The Bible has a word for them. What does the word? The Bible has a word. It starts with me. Yeah, rebellious people, God called rebellious, but that's the word for them. It starts with B. Bastards. I, God came, not me. God came up with that, not me. Bastard. How you want me to say it? This is, this is how they want me to say it. Bastard. No, the Bible said they are bastards. God has nothing for them. Christians. But they're just rebellious as the devil's children. They will not submit to God's word. You read it in the Bible. And then we ask, where is the power? No submission, no power. The Bible said Jesus had to love you. <laughs> Jesus had to submit himself and learn himself. Jesus, who was God. Thank you, God. Wow. Many, let, let, let me share with you where many Christians, many of us Christians. Can I be honest with you? It is Sunday morning. I think that we have one more Sunday in August, right? Yeah. August is almost over. Eight months of the year over. Some of us, we have moved an inch. We're still on, uh, still, the nil still on E. Can I tell you why on E? We're just discouraged. We gave up on God. Because we wanted God to give us something. So we thought, <laughs> I had a preacher, I had a preacher. I wanted God years ago, years ago, years ago, I stood in church. With tears in my eyes. I was about, about 20, 21 crying because I, I, I had something that I needed God to do for me. And it was not happening. And a preacher saw me crying at the back of the church. And he came to me and he said to me, I explained to what happened. He said to me, son, it's not God, it's you. Nobody had, nobody had ever said that to me. He said, son, it's not God, it's you. And then he showed me what God claimed, claimed in the Bible. And he showed me what's happening in my life. There are certain claims about God. And I don't, I'm not seeing it. It's in God's word. And it's clear. And I'm not seeing it. And I'm blaming God. Instead of me submitting myself. And saying, God, you are right. I am wrong. The devil is telling me, see, God is keeping that from you. God is God. It's God. And my heart is getting hard and callous. I start getting slow and slack on the things of God. Are you with me? Positioning myself to be run over by the devil. And I thank God this man came and straightened me up. Are you with me? It, let me tell you, saints, it is not God. It is you and I. Guess where Jesus is? He's seated. If Jesus wasn't seated, it means that he, he would be still walking. The reason why he's, he's seated is because he's done. We just said he's finished. And you and I now have to position ourselves to ensure the power flows. That will not come without transformation. Read what happened to Daniel. Daniel prayed. And as soon as he prayed, bam, the answer came the first time. When the devil saw an angel left heaven and run to earth like lightning, he said, not the next one. Satan said, not the next one. No way. The next time Daniel prayed, another angel was coming from heaven. And for 21 days, the prince of Persia fought with that angel. God uses angels to minister to us. Mm -hmm. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? No, God will send. God told Daniel on two consecutive occasions. From the time you prayed, I said yes. The first time he got it just like that. The second time it took 21 days. For some of us, it's been years. It's not God's fault. God sent me to tell you, stop blaming him. Who, who, who was it that gave me the joke? Was it you, elder? The devil went to God. And what did he tell God? Exactly. The devil cried. He, he went to God saying, God, I'm tired of all these Christians lying on me. It's not me that's doing that. It's they doing it to themselves. The, the devil had to go to God and say, your people are so demon conscious. That's true. <laughs> Everything is a demon. Everything is a devil. The devil did this. The devil. No, you did it to yourself. That's why your own decision. God had to give the devil a hanky yes. to stop crying <laughs> because Christians lying on him. Yes, your fault. Your fault. Think about. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? I know it's a joke, but it's <laughs> but it sounds so it's true. Instead, we affirm the word of God. We're talking about we are talking about the devil did this. That is why we need transformation. And I'm going to submit to you respectfully this right here. I have a lot of people call me and tell me, um, I need deliverance. I had a couple of people call, a couple of folks called my wife and I last week and said, We need deliverance, we'll pay you. Because, because, you know, there's a lot of talk of deliverance going on. Since Christians doesn't need deliverance, they need a transformed mind. That's right. You see, out of respect, I don't want to say anything on Facebook to offend anybody. But I'll tell you here, you have been delivered from darkness. You are now in the kingdom. You need a transformed mind. You don't need deliverance. You don't need no psychic. You've been delivered already. Thank you. It's finished. And, and, and I told, I told, I said, who told you about? Who, I asked him, who told you about us? Oh, everybody know. I said, everybody know about who? I said, sir, meet in my lunch. I'll call you later. <laughs> yes. Are you getting me? You, you, you see where we are? Because every most Christian, I hear it all the time. Deliverance here. Deliverance here. You need to be conformed to the image of Christ. We need a transformed mind. And we haven't started. Are you getting what I'm saying? Paul prayed. Paul prayed. He said to the saints in Galatia, he said, my little children of whom I travail. He said, I'm travailing that you'll be formed, that Christ may be formed in you. You got to see that verse. You got to see that verse. You got to see that verse. You know, I'm trying my best. I said I wouldn't be long, but I tell you, 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 you got to see this verse here. You got to see, you got to see this verse. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's coming. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Woo, thank you, Lord. Isn't God a wonderful God? Hallelujah. If Paul is praying, Paul is praying because you see, transformation is not easy. Galatians 4.19. Transformation is not easy and Paul knows that. And Paul said, he, you got it? He said, my little children, of whom I what? Travail in birth again until what Christ be formed in you he said you need to evolve into a little Jesus pursuit the pursuit of transformation and he's praying because what I'm telling what I'm sharing with you is not easy it's doable let me tell you why it's not easy it's not easy because of a lack of discipline that's all it is that's it we're just not disciplined we can sit down watch a movie I, I went to um my son had me look at one of the uh, um, the Marvel movie. Two and a half, two and a half, two, two hours and forty-five minutes. I said, Emmanuel, two hours and forty-five minutes. You want me to sit down with you? He said, Daddy, will you do it? And the way he said it, I just said yes. But as the movie is playing, my mind is on what I have to do. And the Holy Ghost said to me, Just spend the time with your son. <laughs> <laughs> two hours 45 minutes you know what I can do with that I can break down some Greek verbs memorize a couple scriptures are you with me <laughs> two hours 45 minutes what 
I could read 50 Psalms. You're still human. <laughs> That's a lot of time. And so we just see him and we, we made a party. He got some, uh, he got some sweet tea, praise the Lord. And we got some ice and we, just a boy, that's a, a boy's time, amen? Glory be to God. Glory be, he said to me, he said, Daddy, when can we do it again? I said, son, I'll let you know. I'll get back with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. So... <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. You know, sometimes you, sometimes you just feel like you're behind. You know, you just feel like you're behind because you start late. You're just trying to get everything. That's, that's why we need to change the generation we have. The young kids, we need to pass on the baton the right way. Mm -hmm. We need to pass on the baton the right way to our kids. Mm -hmm. We cannot pass on the baton to, to the generation Joshua pass on the baton to. The Bible says a new generation rose up and they did not know God. Mm -hmm. This morning, I think Ryland came to me and said, Ryland, we prayed that he, Ryland, Tedrick, and uh, what's, your, what's his name? Hayden came for us to lay hands and speak in tongues. And this, and this morning, uh, 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 Ryland said, Pastor, I spoke in tongues. I said, continue. Yeah. How old is he? Seven. Seven. So excited, so pure. Yeah. You got to keep and protect that purity. Yeah. Because all God needs is one man, one woman, yeah. for him to turn the world right side up. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, I told you I wouldn't have time. Second, let's go back to our text quickly. Uh, Second Corinthians 3 8. Yeah, 3 18. Sorry. Let me just show this to you and I'll be and I'll be done. Hallelujah. Uh, so it says, but we all with unveiled face, we all, amen? Who? who? I'm going to show you the five steps. I'm just going to name it and move on. The first step is you got to recognize that you are called to do that. That's the first step. Always important. The mind has to be engaged first. You have to realize that there is a call on your life for transformation. You got to realize that there is a seat at the table of transformation for you. There's a what? A seat at the table. It's not only for preachers and prophets and pastors and evangelists. Are you with me? It is for everybody. Tell your neighbor, there is a seat for me at the table of transformation. Yeah, there is a seat for me at the table of transformation. Are you getting what I'm saying? There is a seat for me. You've got to affirm that. You've got to say it. There is a seat for me. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you got to stand up to yourself inside yourself. You got to step back and say, Emmanuel, why are you doing that? You know better. Stop it. I don't know about you. I talk to myself. I go to the mirror and said, what, what, what is wrong with you? While I'm sipping my sweet tea, what is wrong with you? Why do you do that? I, why did you do that? You know better. Mm? And then I have to run back to God. Run back to God as for forgiveness. Amen. He's such a wonderful father. He gives a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, a sixth chance. Are you with me? That's why he told him. Yeah. He, he, he mesmerized Peter. Peter said, how many times we have to forgive somebody in one day? Is it seven times? Jesus said, 70 times seven. If God tells you to forgive somebody in one day, seven times 70, how much more will he do it? God will never tell you some, to do something he's not willing to do. Are you with me? He'll never tell you to do something he's not willing to do. You and I have to be careful. Amen. We just have to be careful. Do not take advantage of it. Because anytime you mess around, you open a door, you open up a door for the devil. He's coming. Well, well, let me move on here. Some of you. Some of you. So the first, the first step is you got to recognize there is a seat. You are at the table for transformation. Oh, there is a seat. Can I share this with you? I got to, I got to share the scripture verse with you. Go to Hebrews 12, 23. I think I shared it on Wednesday evening. Let, let, let me show you what happened when you became a Christian. 
not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Let, let me show that to you. The Bible says when you become a Christian, you end up being in the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Are you with me? That's what happened. Not only that, which are written where? In heaven. Your name is written where? In the book of books. In the book of life. That's why I'm trying to convince you there is a seat at the table for you. A seat at the table of transformation. Do you know what that means? It means I'm where Abraham is. I'm where Elijah is. I'm where Moses is. Are you with me? I'm where David is. There's a seat at the table. They are seated waiting for me. Where is Emmanuel? He's on his way. He stopped at Starbucks, but he'll be there. Because there's a seat for me. There was an old song. There is room. You remember that song? I remember. You know, you know. You know, you know. So he's only going to grow up in church. Pastor, but there is room at the cross for me. Yes, yes, yes. Though millions may come. Well, there is room for one. There is room at the cross for me. For you. For you. For you. For you. For you. You've been brought to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. <laughs> That's where you sit. You sit among the spirits of just men made perfect. There is Abraham, there is Isaac, there is David, there is you, there is Moses. <laughs> <laughs> so don't you be too hard on yourself you sit among the greats well I just saw him saying oh glory, glory be to you. you one day you must ask God to open your eyes father can you open my eyes let me see what you're talking about glory be to Jesus hallelujah step number one can you go back to our text let me show you step number two step number two here step number two Step number two, so we all with open face, open face. The phrase open face here means with unveiled, unveiled face. And what he's saying is, remember when Moses was in the presence of God on Mount Sinai. Moses spent 40 days in the presence of God. And the Bible said, because God, the Bible says in James chapter, uh, hold on. James chapter 1 verse 25, that God is the father of lights. Yes, yes, yes. You remember that Bible says, is it 125 or 120, 127? Is it 127? I think it said somewhere in there. Yeah. Oh. I think I made a mistake. Anyhow. To visit the Father. Is it James or? Anyhow. I forgot the text. But it refers to God as the Father of lights. In whom there is no turning of. No shadow of turning of. Is it James or? or, or, or? Anyhow. It's somewhere in the Bible. I think I have it. Do I have it here? Sorry about that sins. I just want to show you this right here. Oh, Father, we thank you. We give you praise. 117, sorry, not 125, 117. James 117. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it says here. You got it? Come up down from the Father of whom? Light. So God is the Father of lights. It means that God made all the lights in the universe. Listen, God made all the lights and he shined more than all of them put together. Have you ever thought about that? Oh my God, God made all the lights. That big old sun came from, came from God's mouth. Whoa, all the stars came from God's mouth. Are you with me? And he shines more than all of them. So Moses is sitting in God's presence and they are talking. And the power of God went through Moses' skin. The light went through his skin and he doesn't know his face is shining. So he's coming down from Mount Sinai and he has two big old tablets and he's glowing. His flesh is radiating with light. And the Bible says because he was, because he sat in the presence of God, he was what? Beholding God and because he was watching something, he began to look like it. 
<laughs> oh, glory be to Moses had an open face looking at God. And that's what the Bible is saying. You and I, we are looking at God's word with an open face. There is no veil. The, when Moses went down, the people had to put a veil on his face. Amen. Because his face was shining. That's how unbelievers are. There is a veil on unbelievers' heart. But God is saying, you and I, there is no veil. It's an open face. All you have to do is keep looking at what it says right here. Can you go back quickly? Can you go back quickly? Praise the Lord. I need to bring it home, brothers and sisters. Right here. So open face. So one, you got to recognize that you have a seat at the table. We all call to it. Two, you got to be looking at something. You got to be doing what? Beholding and notice it's in the present tense. Present continuous. Isn't that something you do last month? And then you say, two months back, oh, I forgot to behold. No. Continuously. It's in the present continuous sense. So you got to be beholding it as in a glass, as in a mirror. So this is what the Bible is saying. Can, Elder, can I, can I go in your Bible? I know it looks precious to you. It has writing all over it. Your husband was quicker than you. <laughs> the Bible is saying, just like you look at in a mirror and you see your face. Yes. You look, this is a mirror, God's word. You look in that mirror, and as you look at that mirror, the Holy Spirit takes what's in there and imparts it into you. The more you look at it, the more you begin to look like it. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? That, that's how, because it is done, you have your part, your part is to behold, the part of the Holy Spirit is to ensure that you look like what you are beholding, because the Holy Spirit shows up, he showed, that's why he doesn't want you to read the Bible. Hello, that's why he doesn't want you to read the Bible. That's why every time you try reading, you fall asleep. I am one. Every time you make time, your spouse call you. Can you take out the garbage? No, not now. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Can you cut the grass? Not now, baby. And we are just getting started. Me and the Lord. <laughs> so, the whole... That, that, thank you. You need to have a time, a place, and a program. This is what happened. This is what you doesn't see. When you get into this right here, the Holy Ghost tiptoes and he takes a chair and he comes sits next to you. And you will sense it. Because all of a sudden the Bible come alive. It's not you and your own intellect. Not you and your own yeah. wisdom. It is the Holy Ghost. The teacher finally showed up. Because he saw you took the initiative. That is why he keeps you busy. That's why the devil. The devil and you know, you know who sees that? The devil and demons see that. You don't see that. But the devil and demons see when the Holy Spirit sit next to you. And they are mad. They are saying who can we ask to call him? <laughs> Who can we ask to distract her? Let me tell her friend. Let me call Cassandra and tell Cassandra to call her. Because Cassandra, Cassandra is a body. A body. She might not pick up for anybody else. But I know she'll pick up for Cassandra. <laughs> the devil has one goal. And that is to prevent you from studying God's word. That's all. If he can prove, that's all, and he's satisfied. Because he doesn't want you to become like Jesus. The Bible says you got to be beholding continually. You got to be what? Reading and studying. Say reading and studying. These are two different disciplines. Reading and studying. Amen. Since will you do that? I have so much more to share with you. I'm going to show you the last thing, one of the main reasons why you need to be transformed. You have 60 minutes already? Huh? 51. Okay, good. Well, give me two minutes. Let, let me show you why you need to be transformed. And I don't want you to ever forget that. Let me, let me share with you why you need to be transformed and why many of us are dissatisfied. Romans chapter 29. Yes. Chapter 8 verse 29. Sorry, chapter 8 verse 29. Let me show you. Let me show you the end of Romans 8 29. Let me show this to you. It says here, sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I'm sorry about that. 
Romans chapter 12 verse 2. It says, and be not conformed to this world. Do, do not be plugged into the world system. Okay, the, the, the world has issues. How many of you realize that? Yes. The world is the system that functions. Do not. But be ye transformed. Amen. How? Of your mind. Now here is why God wants you to do that. That. So you can put the big W-H-Y here. Why? Why spend the time being transformed? Why? That you may prove. Who, who, who's going to prove? No, no, no. You. You are going to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will. You will never prove God's will. To prove is to make manifest. You will never make manifest God's will in your life until you are transformed. That's why folks are dissatisfied. They're asking, they're asking, what is, what is God's will for me? Why am I here? <laughs> and notice the Bible says you don't just end up in God's will. Look, look, look at the progression. First of all, you're going to prove what is the good will. And then it gets better. What is the acceptable will? And then what is the what? Perfect will. So when God calls somebody to touch the world, when God calls you to be a doctor, he doesn't start you with a PhD and an MD one time. No, you got to go to school. You got to put your four years. Are you with me? No, that's good. When you go on the internship, no, that's acceptable. Ah, when you, be, yes sir, when you pass the test to be a doctor, now you step into your perfect will. <laughs> Glory! Because you need that maturity. You don't just end up in God's will and say, oops, there it is, no. No. <laughs> No, no. You got to grow. Amen. You got to take your time. You got to be mature because where God is bringing you. Hey, that's where the big, the big what? That's what the big, that's the big leagues. Where God is, that's the big leagues. God always functions in the big leagues. You don't just show up in the big leagues. No. You got to go through before you start playing in the big leagues. You start walking and power flowing through you, people getting healed. It takes some time. It takes the unplugging from the world. Since let me ask you, can you make a decision to unplug from the world? What people say is not important. Let me tell you, what people say about you is not important. What matters is what God says about you that you believe. What who? I cannot develop that. That's another sermon. I have one more scripture. I promise and I'm done. I know preachers have five endings, but this is my second ending. <laughs> numbers, numbers 14, 28. Let me show you. And I promise. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> numbers 14, 28. The children of Israel. God told them they're going to the promised land. Amen. They haven't arrived. They're going through some issues like we are going through issues on earth. And here, what? And they're just murmuring and talking and saying everything God told them not to say. Listen to what God said to them. Say unto them, as truly as I live, say of the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Yeah. He said, you want to, because when your mind is not transformed, you talk a lot of trash. Excuse my friend. Let me say that. When your mind is not transformed, if you don't have the right mind, you don't talk the word. You don't speak the word only. You speak the way you feel, and oh, just, just God said, okay, okay. You, you want to not speak the word? You just want to speak the way you feel? You, oh, you, you just want to express myself? Can I? Somebody said to me, Pastor, I can't express myself. Then I said, express yourself, and when you die, I'll bury you. <laughs> I said, but as for me, I'm speaking the word only. Are you getting what I'm saying? I said, go ahead, express yourself. I say only what God's word said, and I move around. Amen. Because it's a walk of faith. Romans 1:17. The just shall live by faith. So you say what the word says, people. Will you speak the word only? Will you speak the word only? Regardless of your circumstances, even if you don't have what you've been asking God for, trust God. Let me tell you what God likes. When you don't have it as yet, and you're still humble, speaking the word. Oh, that moves God. Oh, yes. You know what it is? When you, have told, when you tell your son, until you do that, you won't get that. And they're still obedient. They don't walk away. 
Are you with me? Doing that is, is, is saying the wrong thing. Your emotions come up and they come up and they end up in your mouth. Mm -hmm. I know because I've done it. <laughs> I'm not teaching what I haven't lived. I have done it to my own peril and had to go back and repent. It is me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I made a mistake. Can you forgive a brother? <laughs> Say, saints, will you do that today? Will you speak the word only? Because God is going to do. God is going to do exactly what you said. But guess what? I know that and every day I'm saying God is doing something new. Every morning I got up, God is doing something new. Oh, I can't wait to say it. God is doing something new. Man, the crooked places are straightened in my life. Every morning I'm saying that and you will see soon and very soon, something new is going. <laughs> oh yes, glory be to Jesus. I've been talking to images of God ministries. I've been saying to IOGM, oh, something new is going to happen to you, church. Oh, bless God. One day, one day, my God, we're going to have two services here. IOGM, can you hear me? I have so much confidence in you. I... Yeah, because God is going to give me exactly what I say. Because it's a walk of faith, not by sight or feeling. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. Please take time to meditate on the Word and let it sink into your heart and soul and mind today. Knowing that the Christian who meditates on the Word will be like a tree planted by the water, bringing forth fruit in its season and prospering in all that he does. But what if you aren't a Christian today? What if you don't know if you're bound for heaven as a forgiven child of God? If that's you, then let's take care of it right now if you're ready. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins and washed clean and made new? Are you ready to begin your new life in Christ? Then turn to God right now and say, Lord, I love you. I need you. I repent of my sins. Lord, please forgive me and wash me clean. I receive your forgiveness right now as I put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. God, please lead me and teach me and show me how to live from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you're looking for a good church family, you'll be welcomed with open arms at Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee, located at 4750 Capital Circle Southeast near Tram Road. Sunday school begins for all ages at 10 a.m. and the morning service begins at 11. And the Wednesday evening service begins at 7. This is a life-giving, multicultural, multi-generational church where people of all races, backgrounds, and walks of life come together to worship, to be inspired in their love for God, to develop relationships, and to be empowered to live out God's purpose for their lives. Find more information on their website, imitatorsofgodministries.com, or call the church, 850-408-8496.